So the next session that we have planned is on food choices and the environmental, social and human rights footprint. So for that, we have our speaker today who is Mr. Krishna McKenzie. So Mr. Krishna McKenzie is a farmer, musician, educator and actor who resides in Auroville and works on the integration of permaculture, sustainable food production, farm to plate traditional meals as well as music and art. He is one of the founders of Solitude Farm at Auroville, which is a six acre permaculture farm built following the tenets of natural farming. So over to you now. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Vanakam. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. Hello. So thank you. Thank you, Krishna, for joining. We launch into a speech, which I can do if you like. This is my third speech of the day. But <laughs> if you want to ask a question, we can start like that. How you want to get going? Just tell me and I will I will start the narrative. <laughs> so maybe you'll have to, you know, often uh, uh, we keep talking about, you know, that uh, sustainable food and what does sustainable food entail? How can somebody make a transition towards sustainable uh, food practices? Uh, also in terms of, you know, what are the challenges when it comes to, to making that shift? If you make that shift, how does it benefit you? What, what are you doing at uh, Solitude Farm and uh, Cafe at uh, Auroville? How okay. has it brought the difference there? So these are a few okay. questions, you know, okay. we would really love okay. to know. So maybe I'll start with uh, my name is Krishna, Krishna McKenzie, and I'm from England. And I've been living in Auroville for nearly 30 years now. I was a student in J. Krishnamurti School in England, and I had a very privileged education where I was not pushed to become anything in particular. You know, neither doctor, engineer, or computer specialist. Not that those are not valuable professions, but I was given a space to... Uh, to explore the you know more existential questions of life and in my final year of my school i was doing research into genetic engineering i was running the vegetable garden and i was doing acting theater and studying jazz guitar with the with the well known indian jazz guitarist amancio de silva and um, and working in the garden i realized that you know a life close to nature a life where we start to understand where our food comes from and our relation to that and our role with that is probably you know the most important thing uh, in 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 anybody's life because without a body you know we all the rest of it doesn't exist i think it's written in Upanishad somewhere something about you know without anna there is no mana you know i don't exactly know the the sloka but it's something like that and it makes sense you know First, there is incarnation on a physical level, and then comes all mankind's great achievements, you know. Um, so understanding about local food has really become the, uh, you know, the theme of, of, my, of my work over the last 30 years here in Oroville. And it's been very much defined by the teaching of my, uh, my mentor, Masanobu Fukuoka, who wrote the, the famous book, The One Straw Revolution. Now, Fukuoka, who was like a nyani farmer, he, he talked about being a fool as the only means to understand one's relationship with Mother Nature. And Mother Nature being the, Mother Nature being the, the reflection of knowing where our food comes from. That relationship, is, is, it defines that. Um, so you can say that, uh, you know, you can say that Fukuoka was exploring a non-interventional way of farming. He was exploring a way of farming which allowed nature to offer us what she does best, which is to, which is to create an incredible biodiversity. If you look at people, what they eat, in the terms of vegetables, at least in our bioregion, I'm not familiar with where you guys are, but in our bioregion, you ask people what vegetables they eat, they'll say broccoli, cabbage, potato, carrots, beetroot. None of those vegetables grow here. And you're like, what, really? So hang on, the culture in Tamil Nadu is so ancient. The language is 40,000 years old. It's considered to be the oldest language in the world. We have a Bharat Natyam, the uh, Carnatic music, we have esoteric texts, the spirituality, we have the poetry from the Sangam period, we have this 
incredible culture. It's like a banyan tree. And one asks oneself, well, how did that culture emerge? Well, it emerged because people knew where their food came from. It's very simple as that. So nowadays, people have no idea where their food comes from. And the food we eat is heavily industrialized. That means, apart from the chemicals and the plowing and the tractors and all of that, it means that there is an incredible amount of ecological cost for such vegetables like potato and carrot and beetroot. Ecological cost, just to bring that home, I'm sure a, a, a university like yours is really familiar with that term, but just for the viewers, no? Ecological cost means the cost to the environment that bringing that potato to your plate incurs to this planet. And that means the factory that was built for the metals, for the lorry. The factories that were built for the tires and the paint and the packed plastics for the lorry. The factories that were built for the electronics and the glass for the lorry. And the endless factories that were built for the petroleum and the, and the infrastructure for the petroleum, like the pipes and the refinery and the oil rig. We're talking about hundreds of kilometers of factories to build a lorry so that we can bring foods that don't grow here and consume them as the you know as the as as our main sustenance there is no logic here those foods did not create this culture that we are so you know in awe of because it's a very beautiful uh, uh, culture so one starts to explore hang on this subject that we're looking at you know is not really about organic farming you know because you can you can buy organic quinoa that comes from Peru, you can buy, you know, organic soya, 10,000 hectares of the rainforest in Amazon were cut down to grow it. It's still organic. It's got the stamp. That's just a, you know, that's, that's, that's neither here nor there. But this is really about a, a cultural redemption, a reclaiming of our cultural identity in the sense of, you know, our nutritional cultural identity. What were the foods that grow around us, that allowed for this particular culture to emerge with all its different colors. And we're in Tamil Nadu. Well, I'm in Tamil Nadu, so I talk about the Tamil, you know, um, Tamil culture. But if we were in Bihar, it would be about, you know, or the culture there and the colors of that particular, um, you know, culture with all the different foods that grow there. And if I was in Peru or Russia, it would be about that particular culture. So. What we start to understand is our food that we eat defines our culture. It's it's what it's the foundation upon which our our cultures have emerged. And a society that doesn't know where its food comes from, that is a society without culture. And humanity without culture, we die, we perish. And that is what's happening in at least in Europe. In England, in America, you have a society that's so fragmented that has no singular value. You know, you ask someone from England like myself, you know, what's what is your culture representing? You know, what do, what is your culture saying? You say well, my culture. No, my culture is beer and football. That's what the English culture is. There isn't something, um, you know, fundamental. Whereas you come, you come in India, and this is not to compare England and India, and this is not, that's not my aim. But if you look in India and, and in Tamil Nadu, let's say, there are still, there is still a common sense of cultural identity. And that emerges, I would say, from a value of what grows around us. So everyone will agree that drumstick spinach is good for us, banana flour can be eaten, banana stem is eaten. And you know a host of different spinaches. These foods are the lowest common denominator within a society. These foods are which we can all agree on. You know, we might not have the same taste in music or in art, or you know, you follow Sri Aurobindo and I like Krishnamurti. That 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 might be the case. However, that's all conceptual. It's uh, ideas, ideals, beliefs. But on a fundamental level, if a society all understands collectively what foods grow around it, they have one common value. And uh, I think that that's what we've seen in solitude over these years, over the last 30, you know, 25 years of running this place, is that 
because we have an organic farm cafe, a farm to plate cafe on the farm, we and we the whole point of this cafe is to honor the plants that grow around us locally. We've gone into depth or into all the colors of this culture. So this balloon vine is used in the dosa and this to the valley with the climbing pea brinjal is in the rasam and the jungly bank and the, the sundaka is in the, you know, in this dish and that dish and the banana stem. And, and we start to see, wow, these plants, they grow without any effort. These plants, because they grow without any effort, they're non-exclusive. Because they're non-exclusive, it means they bring a certain equality to a society. A rich person can have pizza, a poor person can't have pizza, but the beggar and the king alike can have drumstick spinach, the moringa kire. So I think that that's, you know, that's a very, very, uh, you know, uh, pertinent point that local foods that grow easily, that are found in abundance, that have a higher nutritional and medicinal value, because these foods really are the fabric of Ayurveda, you know, they're the fabric of well-being. And these foods that use less water to grow, that are non-exclusive, they're the best foods for us. And at Solitude, recently, we have a pig problem. These foods, the pigs are not touching also. So it's like, wow, you know. These are the foods that we serve every day. Our, our place has become uh, extremely well known. And, you know, on all of that, what's that, uh, you know, trip advice, all these things where they go and, you know, apps to find cafes and stuff. It's um, people are coming here as a destination to eat. And what are they eating? Banana stem curry, you know, a banana flower vade. Kalparavali bhaji, you know, these spinaches. That's all they're having. There are plants that grow locally. So by understanding that, you know, you start to see, wow, this is so simple. This is amazing how, how accessible this narrative is to anybody. People come here, if you would come here and, and eat and you eat the food like many people came today and they're like, wow, Krishna, really, it is good. I said, I know it's good. Otherwise, my speech would be empty words. And they're touched when they left, you know, when they leave. They, they feel good. They feel well. They don't feel stuffed. They feel full. They feel nourished. And you start to see, but I didn't do anything to grow those foods. This is what sustainable agriculture is. This is the future of food on this planet. This is the cultural redemption that every society needs because the society that doesn't know where its food comes from as i said is a society without culture without culture we have nothing and our culture is precisely this relationship with where our food comes from which is a relationship with mother earth which is the soil so this is the narrative that that we have to share in in solitude farm Yeah, thank you so much, Krishna. Uh, 